Thanks, everyone, for coming. Apparently, we're counter-programming against uh, the snack table. So uh, obviously, uh, it's a bit of a thin crowd, but I hope, uh, I hope you uh, get a lot out of it. I really uh, am excited to, to chat with all of you all. Um, so my name is Oliver Roop. Uh, I'm the CEO of Viglink. Uh, Viglink is a company that sits uh, between commerce and content, trying to help publishers uh, and merchants drive economic value from their content and, and most particularly from their links. Um, so I'm going to start off with a brief poll. How many of you guys uh, spend the majority of your time on what I would call uh, you know, the buy side? So an advertiser or a merchant or paying for traffic. Uh, how many of you guys are sort of in that camp? OK, definitely a minority. Uh, how about on, the, on what I would call the sell side? So the publishers selling traffic, getting paid for traffic. OK. A few more, great, uh, and and the rest of you in the middle somewhere, I'm sure. Um, great. So, I think it should come as no surprise to you today that I'm here to talk about uh, links. Uh, so most people think of what you see on screen as as just a link, uh, but I want to tell you today about some of the power for innovation and disruption uh, that stems out of this very simple thing. And one of the things I like to say about the hyperlink is. The hyperlink is the literal H in HTML. It is the, the founding uh, feature of the web. It's not literally hyperlink uh, markup language. It's actually hypertext markup language. But the hyper refers to the fact that links are embedded. So really, um, you know, these, these are the defining feature. Um, and, and I think there's a really uh, you know, great implications and, and a future that everyone in this room c can take advantage of. Uh, so it's a, you know, the innovation behind the link, I think, is both exciting and, and controversial. So the way I see it, links have the power to be a foundation for an entire economy. What I mean is um, there should be a platform on which clicks, site-to-site -site clicks, are priced, bought, and sold, uh, much like uh, in, an, in sort of open and transparent marketplace, much like you see with display advertising today. So, so those of you who've spent some time in the display world are probably familiar with the huge ecosystem of technology uh, that has emerged around display. Um, and basically, I think there's a big coming wave of innovation where similar principles are applied to links, uh, and both merchants and publishers uh, you know, benefit greatly. Uh, so the truth is, we have a long way to go before that's a reality. Um, and it's, it's worth taking a step back and, and looking uh, how far the link has come today. So if you look at ad tech, I would call it dynamic, auction, targeted, and personalized. Right? There, there is a remarkable amount of sophistication that goes into deciding which particular display ad is going to be shown to you um, when, when you land on a site. Uh, it involves you know, maybe a lot more information than I'd say the general public are, are, are aware is known about them. Uh, probably the people in this room are a little more aware of it. Um, <clears throat> there is a competitive process which happens where various merchants or advertisers, excuse me, essentially compete for the right to get in front of certain people. It's targeted, uh, meaning that advertisers only pay for the specific people they would like to reach. Uh, and it's personalized uh, in the sense that, to some extent, your preferences as a reader are taken into account uh, as far as which advertising you see. Now, if you think about link, link technology, almost none of that is true, right? Uh, that there are certainly some counterexamples, but for the most part, links are completely static, liquid, and untargeted, meaning an author, when creating a piece of content, you know, highlights a term, decides where to link to with some process, you know, maybe part of their editorial process or none at all, uh, and then that decision is essentially frozen in amber forever. Uh, if the link never gets clicked on, it still stays there. It still points to the same place. If the page on the other side of the link becomes a 404, too bad. The link still stays there and links you off to an error page. Um, and if you start to think that you know, clicks, uh, the clicks represented through ad tech are a multi-10 you know, multi $10 billion dollar business, and the clicks through, through link tech you know, represented by, by sort of many of the people at this conference are certainly a a, at this point, several billion dollar opportunity and a much faster growing one, uh, that definitely seems like a disparity uh, to me and, and a real opportunity. 
<coughs> excuse me. The other thing, the trend that's sort of playing in this direction, of course, is that the modern web hates display ads. So um, certainly as the web moves to mobile, the, the sort of gutter around the content, which on the web sort of hosts your display ads, are, are either getting marginalized or going away completely. And if you think about the companies that you know, have done a great job of monetizing on mobile, which I'd say like Facebook and Twitter, um, really what they do is they embed advertising into the content itself in a way that it's not some gutter around the outside, it's part of the experience. Uh, and of course, you've heard a lot about native advertising, which is, which is some attempt to encompass this phenomena. Uh, but what is a challenge is that all too often, what is called native advertising is really just spam embedded in your, in your content, right? It, it, readers can sort of fundamentally sniff when a piece of content is put there for, for purely commercial reasons, and it, it creates a negative user experience, and, and you know, they definitely hate it. Um, so I think um, you know, there's a real opportunity to, to bring all the sophistication of display, you know, real-time bidding, automated creative optimization, contextual targeting, behavioral models, retargeting. If you think about it, all that stuff can, can apply to links themselves. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about why. So we sort of think of the link as, as the underdog, right? It, it's, the, it's the unsung hero uh, of, of the web. Uh, and for those of you in the room who are publishers, um, Certainly it has been our experience that in most cases, publishers don't even track the clicks on the links in their content. So, so Google Analytics by default does not keep track. When someone link, clicks on a link pointing off-site, by default Google Analytics just completely doesn't even see it. This is sort of an artifact of the way HTTP was designed, but it certainly could be you know, overcome, and in fact my company does. Um, and, and in those cases where they're tracked, they're very rarely um, metered and monetized and optimized in a way sort of approaching the sophistication uh, of, of display ads. So um, given that the content itself is so much uh, increasing as such a, you know, a, a, the focus, the ability to use ads around the outside is eroding so dramatically, uh, you know, I really think you're going to see the link, uh, you know, come up as a, um, you know, as, as a more, a, an area of more technology attention uh, over time. So um, here's an example. Um, you know, one of our customers, um, I'm, I'm really am just talking about a basic link. The, the con this is a particular, uh, you know, product review site who's one of our customers, and the author, by whatever process, has inserted a link to a product, you know, a, a noun that they have mentioned uh, they've linked out to. Uh, and if you think about it, this is sort of the most authentic advertising experience a user can have, where uh, the author mentioned this product in a completely organic way, and then after the fact, software uh, was used to, uh, you know, potentially insert a link or, or, you know, take a link that existed and make it a monetized link. So. The editor might not even be, I mean, they're sort of conceptually aware that this might happen, but they don't need to change their workflow or think about, uh, you know, how can I make money for, for my, uh, you know, my, publish, my, my, my uh, publication. And so you definitely, uh, you know, by interfering as little as possible with, with the, the authoring process of the site, you really get sort of the most uh, powerful advertising experience that you can have because, because it, it's not sort of ads trying to be content, it's actual content with advertising value. Um, so I think the other thing that's great about them is there's no real estate required, right? The, you don't have to allocate some space uh, to, to your links. Uh, there's no frame or, or, or sort of chrome around the outside. Uh, it, it really happens in the experience of the, uh, of the content itself. So um, if they're so awesome, then they must be worth a lot, right? And, and, and how do we measure that? Um, I'd say it's much harder than you think. So if a hot tech blogger is, say, linking to an Apple TV, and they would think, well, you know, how, what is this link worth? So, we actually have some data from our network uh, that I'm going to share you, with you. You might think, 
well, why don't I, if, if you were going through this process by hand, you might think to yourself, okay, I'm linking to the Apple TV. I know that's sold by Amazon, sold by Best Buy, sold by Newegg. Let's see who offers the highest commission and link to them. Uh, but that would be a mistake because we have found that even, even at a pretty simple level, how much you can expect to make from a link is a function not just of the commission rate, but of the average order value of how much a customer tends to spend at the merchant on the other side and of the conversion rate, meaning how likely the user is to click on this link and how likely they are to buy something on the other side. So when you go do some math, this is, this is real data that we saw in our network in uh, June of 2012, so it's about six months old. This is across our network links to six different merchants who sell Apple TVs and what clicks to those merchants made during that period, I think it was about a month uh, on average. And so you can see at the high side, merchant one is making about 6.8 cents a click on average for, for you know, clicks they send over to that merchant. And, and the, on the low side, a different merchant is, is paying one thousandth of a cent uh, per click on average. So you definitely feel sorry for the blogger who decided to link to Merchant 6 and didn't realize that they could be paid 700 times as much. Um, so uh, Viglink offers you know, technology to automate this. I think you, know, you can use that or do this yourself, but I think the sort of important thing to realize is there's a real opportunity to make a lot more money by focusing on the value of the link uh, and, and what you can do uh, you know, essentially to drive it higher. So here is a very real case. Uh, TechNuts is one of our sort of smaller product review sites who's a customer. Uh, here is a review of a, a you know, do-it-yourself build uh, you know, for, for a sort of a particular type of, of server. Uh, and lower down in the article, they mention the components in the do-it-yourself build and they link out to them uh, on you know, on the various merchants. And if you view source, you'll find that each and every one of them is linked to Amazon. Uh, and, you know, is that because Amazon is paying the most and, and the sort of blogger very thoughtfully decided to link to Amazon? Uh, you know, another argument, which, which I sometimes get in questions, is maybe Amazon has the best experience and so the blogger is trying to, you know, optimize for their customer's experience and, um, you know, is, is thinking of their customer when they link to Amazon. Well, we find that uh, if you think of likelihood of conversion as sort of a proxy for customer, customer satisfaction, customer conversion, uh, and commission rate obviously as sort of the, the, the flip side of the equation, like how much the merchant is willing to pay, you, when you take the product of those things and the average order value, Amazon does not, and I, you know, candidly I would say, very often does not come out on top. Uh, and so, really, this publisher is leaving money on the table. And, you know, if, if, if you take it a, a step further, which, you know, candidly, we haven't even done yet, if you think about what, it, because it's render time, there's lots of things you know about this reader. So, let's say the reader is in France. How much should Best Buy be willing to pay for a click from a French reader? Probably that, not that much, right? Because, uh, French readers are unlikely to pay in American dollars and ship across the Atlantic. So really, the links that French readers see should be linking to French merchants. Um, you find similar with, uh, you know, platform choices. So, uh, you know, we see across our merchants, typically mobile always converts a little bit worse than, than the web, but how much worse dramatically varies. So, you know, one merchant may convert on mobile at, say, 90% of the rate of their web uh, traffic. And another merchant, uh, you know, this is, this is a real number, will convert at, say, 10% of the rate of their web traffic. So if, if one click in 10 on the web converts on their site, you might see only one click in 100 converts on their mobile site. And so if a publisher has a reader on mobile, should they link to that, that merchant who is very likely to throw the click away, particularly if the merchant only pays on a CPA basis? Um, and so there's, there's a real opportunity here for publishers to get smarter about the links they have and where they point and optimizing, you know, for value to themselves. Uh, so just to drill into this particular example, we found that, um, 
you know, Walmart and M-Wave and, and other world computing uh, were actually merchants that performed better for these particular links in practice. And this is not, uh, you know, sort of a theoretical, uh, like we actually measure it on an A-B testing basis continuously to try to understand who is paying the publisher more and, and really drive the publisher uh, the most possible money. So, um, you know, obviously there are a couple technology solutions, but I think even doing it yourself, and I think coupon sites have done a reasonably good job at this, you, you can implement this technology internally, and it's a really fruitful area to think about. Where, you know, how can I use technology to optimize where I send my traffic so that I maximize how much I get paid? So we find, on average, that when a publisher permits link optimization, meaning they permit the destination merchant of their links to, uh, you know, to be changed to a different merchant selling the same product, that pub publisher on average makes three times uh, as much as they make from an unoptimized link. Uh, so obviously that is, is pretty dramatic. And I think if you think about you know, what Google did with AdWords, um, there is an upward trend over time, right? If you look at the price of a given keyword you know, over the last 10 years, that trend has been sort of ever and up and to the right because competition effectively drives higher prices, right? The, the, the merchants who can most successfully exploit the traffic bid for it, competition bids up the traffic. And I think that is really the situation you want to find yourself in as a publisher. How can you get the various buyers of your, potential buyers of your traffic to compete for it and pay more? Uh, and so I think really con using software you know, as an optimization opportunity is a, is, is a real opportunity for the publishers in the room. And by the way, for the merchants in the room, uh, there's an opportunity as well, which is you have an opportunity to buy traffic that would otherwise have been going to your competitor. So, uh, you know, Amazon has this great uh, tailwind, essentially, where um, a lot of people, when they decide to insert a product link, they just insert an Amazon link because it's just what pops to mind easiest. Uh, you know, and, and they sort of do a search and they insert the link. And so if you're a competitive merchant, how do you, how do you get traffic, right? You can buy it on SEM, and we all know how expensive that is. You can run display advertising, and I'm sure you're doing that. You can market to your own customers. But ultimately, the sort of freer source of traffic on the web is uh, traffic from content, right? Uh, smaller sites that have enthusiasts uh, who are thinking and talking about your product and how do you get them to come to you instead of your competitor? And I think this is how. Uh, so again, this is real data. It's for a subset of our clicks, so it sort of doesn't tell you about our, our entire network. But you know, we have shared this exact yield curve with advertisers where we've essentially said, look, if you're paying five cents a click, you're going to win the bid 50% of the time. Uh, if you're paying 10 cents a click, you're going to win about 77% of the time. And if you're paying 25 cents a click, you're going to win 95% of the time. Now, obviously. You know, it, it's nonlinear. It varies by product. Um, you know, we ultimately want to get to a situation where Google, you know, what Google does where they say sort of like you tell us the maximum you're willing to pay and we'll charge you the second highest price plus a penny. Uh, we're not there yet today. But I think this is how you uh, can convince merchants to pay more. And no one's saying, you know, go, go win 100 Like this graph goes all the way to the right because there actually is a slight upward curve on what looks like that flat line there. Uh, so if you wanted to win really 100% of the bids, you know, you'd have to be paying $2.50 a click, and, and no one thinks that's a good idea. Uh, but I think um, you know, knowing that there's a yield curve where you can pay more and get more traffic, I think is you know, a powerful notion not just for publishers, but for merchants as well. So you know, we really do think of three constituents, all of whom have to be satisfied. Uh, the consumer, we really do want to uh, you know, link them to the merchant that is most relevant, where they are most likely to convert. And that may be Amazon. Um, you know, but I think the, 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 the story I mentioned about geography and platform uh, you know, and, and certain subsets of products, you know, um, certainly you could imagine like Amazon would do very well for books and, and sort of be the dominant merchant, but maybe less so for apparel. Uh, and, and so. You know, you, you definitely want to optimize for the consumer experience, and we sort of measure that by conversion rate. Um, you definitely want to uh, optimize for publisher revenue, because that's really what, chooses, what, what convinces publishers to choose us. And in fact, we get paid as a percentage of what publishers get paid. And then for the advertiser, uh, you, know, you really want to be able to sort of unlock that new traffic. 
Uh, and you know, I certainly wouldn't claim that everybody is a winner out of this scenario, right? There certainly are merchants who historically have benefited from you know, links that were pointing to them anyway uh, you know, that they weren't really paying for. Um, you know, the way I actually started Viglink was I wrote a crawler to go look for links to Amazon. I found that less than half of them had an affiliate code. So people were sending clicks to Amazon that they could have gotten, gotten paid for if they would just add 10 bytes to their URL, but they were not doing it, and they were giving away that traffic for free. And so without, without changing a single pixel on the page, we could make publishers money. That situation is a lot more uncommon today, but certainly uh, you know, the lack of optimization, I'd say, is totally pervasive in this completely greenfield market. Um, that basically covers it. Um, obviously, we've gone a little bit faster than planned, but I uh, am interested in, in Q&A. If there are any questions out there, I'd, I'd love to answer questions. I know there's always one. First one's the hardest. So uh, at, at Viglink, we, um, so I, I definitely sort of try to uh, avoid framing the talk as a sort of pitch for my own company, but you know, obviously this is an arena we care a lot about. We have a JavaScript library that a publisher puts in their page, and we just sort of do all this automatically for you, and we take a cut of your revenue. I think uh, you know, for, for publishers trying to do it themselves, uh, you know, I think a click tracking platform, uh, you know, we've seen Google Analytics, it actually can be modified to track outbound clicks. Um, also, some of the link shorteners like Awesome or Bitly, uh, you know, can can be used to sort of feed spreadsheets. Uh, I think you're going to have a hard time uh, optimizing on a page view by page view basis. So you you really need essentially a custom software platform. Um, like I said, the coupon guys I think have actually done a pretty good job of this, where they measure yield, uh, you know, on a pretty much a click by click, impression by impression basis, and decide which links to show people to maximize revenue, but <clears throat> it's not very common amongst publishers. No, it, it, it's a totally, uh, it, it's a real point, and, and frankly, we also have frustrations with clicks that don't track, and, and uh, you know, everyone sort of shrugs their soldier, shoulders and essentially says, yeah, that happens sometimes. Oh, excuse me, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, the question was, do you use um, affiliate networks sort of as your back end for, for buyers? Uh, the answer to that one is yes, uh, but not exclusively. So we work with affiliate networks, we work with some merchants directly, we work with um, comparison shopping engines like Price Grabber and Shopzilla. Really, anyone who is in the business of buying traffic, we want to be selling it to them. Uh, although we don't do a lot of direct yet, just mostly because of you know sort of scale and bandwidth issues. Uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, engineering bandwidth, not internet bandwidth. Um, the second part of the question was: Was is there you know do you have concerns around tracking? Like bloggers certainly see these concerns. Do you experience them too? So we do to some extent. Uh, we think of it a bit like Google thinks about click fraud, right? Which is, at the end of the day, what, what an advertiser should be measuring is how much did you spend and how much revenue did you get? And, you know, what's the ROI? And so a network that is losing 10% of its traffic, the EPC will come out 10% lower, right? So if, if a network were to drop, you know, 99 clicks out of 100 but then pay $10 per click, that sort of looks the same to me as a, uh, as a network that uh, you know, pays one cent a click, but you know, whatever the math is, I just made it up. Let's call it you know, $10, a dollar a click for, for all you know, 10 clicks out of 100. So at some level, it shouldn't matter, right, in, in that we measure by the EPC we actually get paid, and if they're screwing up and losing traffic, it's going to come out in a lower EPC and they're going to get less traffic. It's still really frustrating, especially when uh, you know, a publisher says, I know that click converted to a sale, where's my commission? Um, candidly, it's, we're not really designed for that, nor are most affiliate networks. So Amazon, for example, if they figure out that you're clicking on your own links to make commission on your own purchases, they'll invalidate it. Uh, and that, that sort of happens more commonly than you think. So it's not, it's not really designed for 
you know, discounting, where like someone makes a specific purchase and, and goes for the click. It's more designed for publishers who have you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of clicks, and on average, you know, they worry about the average EPC. So, so at that case, the, the tracking issues sort of net out a bit, but, it, but it's still very frustrating. There are, some, there are some networks who have sort of better reputations around this than others. Um, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but you know, we can talk privately after. But I, I, I think everyone is trying to work on it. I think some of the newer networks that you know, have a more modern stack that tends to lose clicks less often. Who's next? <laughs> so uh, everyone, this is Will Johnson, uh, a big link employee. Um, what is the ceiling of the yield curve? Um, that's a good question. I think we think about it as um, cost of sale. So when we've spoken to merchants, uh, and this is by far, this is not sort of a scientific broad-based study, but, but anecdotally, uh, merchants have said to us, we typically pay in these sort of 8 to 15% cost of revenue. So to make $10 in, um, in revenue from AdWords, we pay somewhere between $0.80 cents and $1.50 uh, to get that traffic, right? And, and that's kind of our target range. It varies, so consumer electronics is much lower. Uh, apparel is in the high side of the range. Um, if you look at the affiliate business, uh, or at least the, the, the part of the affiliate business we play in, which is sort of like the retail products part of the affiliate business, not sort of, um, you know, less the offers that, that a lot of people here talk about, but more sort of products. On average, uh, merchants pay about 5%. Uh, so they pay 50 cents for $10 worth of revenue. So in AdWords, we have an existence proof that, that uh, merchants are willing to pay more than they are paying now. Uh, and so why? Well, because... Uh, I mean, when we ask them, they say, you know, it's cute that I can turn 100 grand into 150 grand, but what I really want to do is turn a million into a million five, and that's hard with affiliate because, you know, I've got to go to Affiliate Summit and find all these, like, smaller, or PubCon, and find all these smaller bloggers and sign them off one by one, and it just, it's hard to really get scale for my dollar. So instead, I devote my money to AdWords. So if there is a technology platform by which they can scalably put more money and get more money out, uh, you know, we have certainly seen evidence that they're willing to put more money in. And so, you know, we believe that essentially the, the cost of sale can rise to at least the same level as AdWords. Because at the end of the day, you know, a, a merchant who pays 10 cents on the dollar for traffic has a lower margin business than one who pays 8 cents uh, on, on the dollar for traffic. So they should shift their spend, all things being equal. So, so what's not equal is the scalability and the liquidity. And, and obviously, we're working to, to change that. I didn't actually plant that question, but <laughs> who's next? Yeah, please. Um, do you have uh, tools specifically for like WordPress, WordPress Of course, uh, we do. Uh, um, yeah, all the all the common platforms. And and again, I, I feel like I'm moved into pitch mode. We have competitors who have who have tools as well. Uh, you know, and and you know, there are definitely choices out there. Uh, so, you know, not. Um, not trying to just stand here pitching my own product. Is that, is that still like the big platform? Is anything else that that was more I got you. Um, I, WordPress is still, I think, probably, uh, there's a big question. If you look at it by hosts or by page views or by traffic volume or by revenue, you get very different answers, right? So I think, I think by uh, page view and traffic volume, WordPress, Broadly, is, is still probably the largest uh, blogging platform. Uh, I'd say if you're looking by revenue, not at all. Um, we actually see great results in forums. So like the Bulletin, uh, you know, all, all the PHP, BB, all the forums, they do really well. Uh, you, um, if you sort of go look at these sites, you'll notice that there's sort of um, a lot of very authentic conversations of the type, you know, I have a thousand bucks in my pocket, should I buy product A or product B? Real discussion ensues. People put links in the conversation. Uh, Google SEOs that stuff really well. So someone who's looking for the answer to that question types the question, you know, lands on a forum page, clicks through to the merchant. So on a revenue basis, uh, forums actually, I'd say, outperform everything. Um, but, but there are lots of different things. So, so um, you know, Wanello is a good example of like a, of a 
you know, a Pinterest clone that links off to merchants and, and sort of drives uh, revenue, and, and you know, they do very well. Uh, so I think um, when you look by revenue, you see a very different answer than when you look by page view volume. Uh, it's called Wanello, W-A-N-E-L-O. If I can just sort of repeat a little bit of that uh, on, on the mic, I think the, and, and transliterate a little bit, um, the, in the display world, there's a very agreed upon sort of hierarchy of who the best sites are and who aren't. So like the Comscore 100, everybody wants to go advertise on the Comscore 100 because everybody agrees those are the best sites. Uh, and that may be true in the display world, but in the uh, you know, content-driven commerce world, we see a radically different pecking order. Uh, and we do have some Comscore 100 sites who frankly perform poorly, uh, and, and the sites that perform well are often these fairly niche, well, perform better on a CPM basis, right? Uh, are often these sort of niche smaller sites with focused audiences and, and focused content, and, and hopefully that's good news for all of you. I mean, the, the publishers in the room, I think, if you're trying to beat Huffington Post at the Huffington Post game, I think you're gonna have a hard time, but I think if you've, uh, you know, carved out a niche uh, you know, that you are legitimately enthused about and, and you know, are writing authentic content around, uh, at, at least on a you know, sort of modulo traffic basis, you can outperform the very biggest guys. And, and you know, we certainly, uh, we, Viglink and some of our competitors, I think, are trying to sort of popularize the notion that this pecking order in the display world is one view of the world, but not the only one, right? And, and that when you look at it through a different lens, a very different rank order comes out. And, and of course, those sites are happy to hear from us because the display networks all often treat them very poorly. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the hearing from us is, is exciting to them. So, uh, you know, I'm glad that not everyone's going after the exact same 100 sites or this would be a, a boring and tough business. Who's next? Yeah, please. Uh, so the question is, um, you know, tracking external clicks. Uh, so, for example, if a user is clicking through to buy a jersey, uh, you know, uh, on Fanatics, I'm, I'm guessing perhaps, um, how how would we we or or one in general uh, track that click? And I think the answer is, um, on if you're Fanatics, you're on on the sort of receiving side of the clicks. Uh, you probably use Google Analytics or some similar product that looks at the referral header and uh, tries to understand where, where, the, where the click is coming from and, um, you know, and, and ideally measures the sort of ROI of certain traffic. So like, you know, traffic from Google searches, you know, is worth this much to us and so we'll spend, you know, this much to get more of it, but, you know, traffic from Facebook maybe is, is all, you know, looky-loos. Um, so that, that, that lets you speak to the traffic you already have. What it doesn't speak to is the traffic you didn't get, right? So someone who's, clicking through to one of your competitors instead. Uh, and there you need some sort of upstream, you know, upstream solution like us, or you know, there are many sort of marketing automation products that can try to assess this for you, which is to say like, where is the traffic your competitors are getting coming from so that you can go approach those people? Um, obviously it's, it's challenging to do at scale, um, but there probably is some 80-20 rule where it's like a small number of sites are, are a source of, of um, you know, a, a disproportionate share of the traffic, uh, to approach the small guys one by one and say, hey, can you make those apparel jersey links point to Fanatics instead of our competitor, you know, uh, that's gonna be super labor intensive and may not be worth uh, the ROI. So a, a product like ours, uh, you know, we track the click by, I mean, technically by just putting a JavaScript handler in the page, so when a click happens, we capture it and report it back to ourselves. Um, and and 
you know, to track that kind of holistic traffic, you need some sort of third party, uh, you know, some are sample panel based, some are sort of direct integration with the publishers like ourselves. Direct integration has the advantage that they can potentially move the traffic to you. Uh, panels potentially are more broad based, so like they speak to the whole network, not just our customers. But then, but then to actually get that traffic, you'd have to go talk to the publisher. So I think um, looking at the upstream traffic and figuring out how to get more of it is a sort of an iterative marketing sales process. Who's next? Let's see if we get one more, and I'm happy to wrap a little early and let everyone make it to the to the snack table. Yes. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so, so I think the question was, you know, can we give you some assurance the software works by using a test link? Is that? Oh, you mean the, the uh, oh, I see. So I think the question is, um, you know, for the merchants and networks who lose clicks, can we sort of find that by doing test clicks? Um, it's, it's hard to do it at sort of scale on a statistically relevant number. So you can certainly try, you know, one click to a merchant, see if the purchase tracks. Um, you know, our, our experience is that almost all the clicks track almost all of the time. And, you know, it, it, uh, it would sort of be a pretty big budgetary exercise to sort of do, you know, hundreds of purchases on a, on a particular publisher to see uh, you know, if they track, and, and sometimes the problems are isolated to particular browser versions, or, you know, sometimes it feels like the phase of the moon. So, um, you know, we do occasionally do test purchases. Uh, you know, actually, when I first pitched the business, I sort of pitched like a secret shopping function we could do to bring quality assurance. Um, to be honest, it's hard to do at scale, and so we, we haven't really operationalized that in, in a big way. Um, you know, we are looking for a solution to that problem, I think. Certainly, um, I think if you look at what AdWords did, AdWords started out as this very simple algorithm. How much is the advertiser willing to pay for the click times the likelihood a click occurs? Sort, top four are in, everyone else is out. And then over time, you know, quality scores and page speed and just sort of like hundreds of factors all became relevant. So we certainly hope to do that, right? So, so ultimately, you could imagine like a merchant reliability index, which is some factor where you know, if, if merchants tend to lose clicks, they get penalized and less likely to show up. Candidly, we don't do that yet. I don't think anyone does that yet. Um, it would certainly be a good way to get the merchants to improve. And, and I would say affiliate tracking technology in general is not state of the art. Okay, uh, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate your attention. And